Welcome to our second artist panel for Connected Diaspora, U.S. Central American Visuality in the Age of Social Media at the Stamp Gallery. This exhibition has a physical component in the Stamp Student Union, and you are welcome to visit it or make a reservation. More information can be found at our website at stamp.umd.edu forward slash gallery. Um, uh, my name is Tara Youngborg and I'm the manager of the Stamp Gallery. Um, and I'm so thrilled to have this exhibition um, this fall. I would also like to thank our exhibition co-hosts, the Schools of Language, Literatures and Cultures, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of Maryland, as well as La Casa de la Cultura de El Salvador in Washington, DC. Uh, without their generous sponsorship, we wouldn't be able to have nearly as many virtual artist panels. Um, and programs as we've been able to. The first thing I would like to do is a land acknowledgement. Every community owes its existence and strength to the generations before them around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy into making history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to migrate from their homes in hope of a better life. And some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical in building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. In the Division of Student Affairs, we believe it is important to create dialogue and honor those that have been historically and systemically disenfranchised. So we acknowledge the truth that is often buried. We are on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who were among the first in the Western hemisphere. We are on indigenous land that was stolen from the Piscataway people by European colonists. We pay respects to the Piscataway elders and ancestors. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration and settlement that bring us here today. Now I would like to introduce the curator for Connected Diaspora and our moderator for tonight's panel. Veronica Melendez is a visual artist based out of Washington, DC. From illustrations of iconic household products to photographs documenting the diaspora of Central Americans within the DC metro area, her work is greatly influenced by her Latinx upbringing. Having been raised in DC within one of the largest Central American communities in the United States, her work gives a platform to a voice that is often marginalized and serves as a powerful reminder of the importance of culture and representation in art. Veronica has a MFA in photography from the University of Hartford and has exhibited across the DMV region in New York and internationally in Scotland and Germany. She was also the 2019 Spring Darkroom Resident Artist at the Capitol Hills Art Workshop. Another of this version, or another version of this exhibition was curated by Veronica for Duke University. Veronica is also a founder of La Orchata Zine, a seasonal arts publication highlighting creatives with Central American ancestry. Now I'd like to turn it over to Veronica to introduce our artist panelists. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really thankful to be here moderating this panel. Um, and today on this panel, uh, we have Jesse DeSantis. Uh, Jesse was raised in a predominantly Caribbean Miami, Florida, but in a Nicaraguan household. Jesse DeSantis is an up and coming self-taught artist, young mother of two now residing in Baltimore where she creates thoughtful, vibrant work celebrating Baltimore's Latinx community and her rediscovered Central American indigenous roots. Her art is a proud celebration of identity, culture, and belonging. Jessie has exhibited her work at Duke University and at the Baltimore City Hall during the Hispanic Heritage Month celebration in 2019. She is also the recipient of the Neighborhood Lights Community Grant in Baltimore. Today, we also have Celia Guevara. Celia Guevara is an artist born and raised in Honduras. She immigrated from her native country in 2006. She received her Bachelor in Fine Arts from the University of Houston in 2017 and her Master's Degree in Fine Arts from the Houston Baptist University. Celia's work is inspired by the human condition and the continued whispering of her Garifuna heritage. In July of 2018, Celia embarked on a trip to La Ceiba, Honduras to present her solo show, which is an extension of her thesis in fine arts and studio practice. It embodied the essence of her Garifuna culture through her life-size drawings, paintings, and printmaking. 
Celia's studio practice is developed with this insurmountable passion and is vividly portrayed in her artwork. She is determined to earn a solid reputation as it relates to her artistic and cultural identity. And last but not least, we also have Kim Levon. Uh, Kim Levon is, has received her Bachelor of Fine Arts in Ceramics and Painting from the University of Central Missouri in Warrensburg in 2011. She received her Master's of Fine Arts in Ceramics from Indiana University in 2015. Since then, she has completed two artist residencies at the International Ceramics Studio in Kecheme, Hungary. Kim has presented her work and research at the Death, Art, and Anatomy Conference at the University of Winchester, UK, and completed the Charlotte Street Studio Foundation residency in Kansas City, Missouri. And her artwork has been on exhibit at the Clay Studio in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the Museo de Ceramica de La Cora in Castello, Spain, the University of Winchester in Hampshire, England, and the Capolna Gallery, Galleria in Kecheme, Hungary. She currently lives and works in Kansas City, Missouri. And thank you so much for all of you for joining me in this panel discussion. Um, to start us off, we're going to start with Jesse. Uh, Jesse, could you start us off by talking us through your journey as an artist and how you became a self-taught painter? Sure. Hi, I'm Jesse DeSantis. I uh, started painting two years ago. Um, I uh, was raised in Miami and moved to Baltimore as an adult. Um, had a child here. I have two children now. And um, when I moved to Baltimore, I had a career change and, and decided to pursue art. Um, so I'm self-taught. And uh, a lot of my early works, if you want to go through them, here's one. This is uh, my stoop here in Baltimore. And it was very much just my surroundings and um, incorporating my heritage as a Central American, specifically from Nicaragua, um, and then incorporating that in where I am today. Uh, and then also moving here was uh, a, like a second homecoming because I'm from Miami. It's predominantly Caribbean. So my family, we are, we are in Nicaraguan. We're also from El Salvador, but we're also Cuban, Puerto Rican, and Dominican and, and whatnot. Um, but when I moved here to Baltimore, uh, there's a large Central American community, uh, which is more dominant than, um, I guess, Miami, whereas my household was. And we had a community, but it was predominantly Cuban. Um, so it really inspired me to start off uh, painting. So I was just really painting where I was, um, how I felt in, in this new place. Um, and then today, I um, am exhibiting at the Stamp Gallery a portrait, which is very different from what I started off painting, which was like architecture or whatnot, um, but also including natural elements. Um, thank you. Could you speak about how you were able to connect to the Central American community in Baltimore when you moved here from Miami? Sure. So it was, you know, as simple as going to a park. Um, Patterson Park is in uh, near Highland Town in Baltimore, and it is predominantly Central American. So having like, you know, La Pupuceria and and Mexican restaurants, and then the people you're surrounded by um, being Central American, uh, that was that was like, you know, very visibly different. Um, the music you know, and, and, and the culture. Yeah, I really feel like um, this, you can feel that and hear that in your painting, specifically this one that's being shown right now. I remember when I saw it, I just, it reminded me just as, as a kid, like being in DC and feeling like this mixture of the city being mixed with Central America all together and just being this vibrant place. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I try to do here. It was, it was definitely a blending of cultures, um, you know, and then using the birds, it's like, a, for me, it represents a spirituality or like an instance in the air that you don't see, um, but it's represented in my paintings, you know, the, they're also migratory. So I feel like that's very much where we are, you know, here in, in the North. Yeah, this seems to be something that comes up in a lot of your paintings, the different birds, right? Right, that's right. Even now in um, the portrait I have displayed at the gallery, there's a, there are a couple birds um, 
present in it um, as symbols. Uh, so um, the portrait that I do have is of my grandmother and she migrated uh, from Nicaragua after uh, the Civil War there. She migrated to New York. So she's a New Yorker. She's been there for 20 something years. And, and the reason why I painted her was um, because of the admiration I have for her. And she's uh, like the matriarch, you know. Uh, I never got to know my grandfather. My father, my own father passed away when I was a little girl. So our family is very much a matriarch and, and the head of household are women and very powerful, strong women um, who have lived through um, so very much. So I wanted to um, really paint her with respect and dignity um, and also just tell stories for my own uh, children. And I think that's the idea is, you know, to paint with storytelling. Um, thank you for showing them the, the visual. This is my grandmother. Um, things that I saw in her that I really, um, you know, those qualities that I want to pass down. Like I try to put those symbols in, um, in the painting, you know, like her tattoo of, you know, a beautiful rose, but having it just proudly disp displayed on her breast and how rebellious that spirit is um, to um, the seeds that are around her portrait are pitaya. Um, so it's like a cross section of a dragon fruit. And to me that, that symbolizes her own fruitfulness and our large family. And then in them, the stories that I wanna continue to tell for our future generations. Um, and then also going back to her, you know, being from Nicaragua and in New York, when I took her photograph for this painting, she was wearing the symbol of um, Jewish identity, the Star of David. And I asked her about it and she didn't, you know, she didn't see it as like a Jewish identity, but to me it represents, you know, that, that multicultural, um, you know, that multicultural uh, um, influences that she's getting here. You're right, <laughs> being in, in New York now. Um, and yeah, and, and also um, the birds that are in the, the painting, uh, the one on her shoulder is the Guarda Barranco. And again, it's very spiritual to me. It's, um, uh, it's like this essence that's, you know, that's there and that you feel like it's, it's my roots, it's her roots, it's our future generation, that, that's our roots, you know. Um, the bird is native to Central America. Uh, yeah, so that's, a, that's what I'm working on right now is uh, portraits and then also just focusing on natural elements that really ground us and tell stories about where we come from, especially now that we're here, that we're in, um, we're, in we're not in our countries right now, right? Um, I have children and I wanna be able to pass this on, but like, hey, this is where you come from too, as well. And what that means and, and really not that I just really want to hold on to that. And I feel like my storytelling is through painting. So um, that's that's what I'm working on. And that's that's what's displayed right now at the gallery. Thank you so much for sharing. That's really beautiful. Sure. Um, I remember when we've spoken before, you've mentioned that this painting was kind of like a pair. It came with another painting. Yes, that's um, right. Can you speak about that other painting? That yeah, so this really painting beautiful. is yeah, so the painting is um, paired with my father's side of the family. Um, again, I didn't grow up with my father. Uh, he passed away when I was a little girl. Um, but I really want um, there to be a, you know, a complete picture of where I'm from, whereas I'm multiracial and my mother is Nicaraguan and I, I very much grew up in that culture and those are my roots, but I was also exploring and, and really wanting to get to know um, about my father's side of the family. So I chose a relative there and um, painted the two portraits in a very similar way where there's spots that tie in to both of them. Um, and here it's the pitaya fruit, you know, the pitaya seeds tie into my grandmother's freckles. Uh, for the other painting, it, they were spots from the terrapin turtle that 
that ties into um, these portraits. So it, again, it's natural elements there. Thanks, thank you so much. Um, thank you. And are you currently working on anything right now or do you see, where do you see your, um, your practice going? Because I know this is one of the first, um, is this one of the first portraits that you painted, yeah? Yes, so this is the first portrait. Um, I'm, I'm actually, I, this was my first year growing corn. I feel like that's connecting, you know, like I'm made of corn, you know, <laughs> we grow up and we're still eating corn and um, growing uh, corn this year, it's uh, inspired me to also paint it. <laughs> so right now I'm working on a painting of, um, or I'm blending uh, bird feathers with a, uh, of corn that I grew from my garden. Yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. Oh, that's that's amazing. <laughs> that's really great. Um, where did you get the seeds for the corn? Just out of curiosity. So I, you know, I don't even remember where I got them. <laughs> um, but it's very important um, to pass the seeds along and, you know, it, and know where the seeds come from. I'm learning as I'm going. Um, I've connected with uh, urban farmers here in Baltimore City who, I mean, they don't even realize it, but they're, they're educating me on like seeds and, and uh, you know, the importance of passing them down uh, for the next harvest and sharing them. And um, yeah, so I think these seeds, I definitely have kept them. I plan on making tortillas and masa and, and learning more about the nixtamalization process. Um, so yeah, if you want some seeds, let me know. <laughs> I, might, I might let you know. <laughs> it's hard to find seeds that aren't um, genetically modified, right? Right, yeah, I'm learning about that now. Um, I'd also, if you could, speak to, about just your experience um, being in this exhibit, not only at Maryland, but also at Duke and just your thoughts and feelings of just the representation of Central Americans in the art spaces. I'm glad you mentioned that because I wrote it down that I wanted to thank you for this. This is a huge deal. I mean, I, I grew up with a lot of Latin American Caribbean people, but representation like this, like Central American representation, in the art specifically, I mean, it was just non-existent. Um, one of the things that I've shared with my own cousins that are in Miami right now is um, La Chata, the zine. And I mean, I, I got like so many prints and I was just sending them to them because I know that's something that I would have wanted. I probably would have started my artist career earlier if I had been exposed and represented in that light. Um, so I, yeah, this is huge for representation and I really admire what you're doing and thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate those words and also just thank you as well just for, for creating um, and sharing it with all of us. I really appreciate it. Um, is well, thank there you. Else you'd like to share about your work? Um, um, I think I've touched on everything. I'm really excited to hear about the other talented artists in the panel. So thank you so much. Yeah, of course. And if anything comes up, please feel free to I, shout out. Um, okay, well, uh, we're gonna move to our next panelist, um, which is Celia Guevara. And yeah, so we could get the slides moving to the next one if possible. <laughs> Hi, Celia. Um, I'd love to for you to start us off and talk to us about just your your experience um, being a creative in Honduras and then coming to the states also and pursuing your artistic career here as well and how that transition was for you and where you are now with your artwork as well. Hey guys, uh, thank you for having me here and. Uh, well, how was my career in Honduras and how is right now over here? So I came to this country, I think it will be 14 years soon. And I came because I got married 
And at that time I didn't have kids. Now I have three. I started my career formally at the age of 16. So I went to school and I was the only one, the only black person in the whole entire school, the school of, uh, I will say 200 students. And I am more into my culture because I saw that everything that I was learning in there was not representing my culture. So I said to myself, there gotta be something else that I need to do. So I'm gonna be able to see what I really wanna see in my culture. So that's how I started. And then later I migrated to this country and I finished my um, bachelor degree at the University of Houston. And there I was immerse into what I will say painting basically mostly it was painting it was three periods where I was just making paintings and then uh, I switched from painting to charcoal so what you see over here was the was a series of three um, uh, figures. I am so intense when it comes to to drawings. I loved drawing figures because it was a challenge for me. Um, first, because um, I want to be able to see not only the outside of a the humanness, but I also want to be able to capture the spirituality. And for me, it is very important uh, to, to develop and, and to depict the figure in a way that not only can, can be realistic in a, in a way. Because um, I believe that every one of us have something that we need to tell, that we need to share. And the, the human figure for me is the, the door that it will open to many other possibilities. So that's why I get to be so um, detailed in from drawing and painting the human figure. So for this one right here that you are looking, that you are seeing, this was a process in my life when I get to be a mother, I get to be a student, I get to be a wife at that point, and everything was falling apart. I thought that I wasn't able to go through all the things that I went through because it was heavy. It was very heavy, not just in my physical body, but also mentally and spirituality, because I was I will call, I will, I will say that it was kind of like a mm, metamorphosis process with this, all of this. And, and it was difficult for me. So that's why I get to uh, be connected to the nature. So for me, I wanted to be grounded. I wanted to be able to see where am I? So connection with the nature as um, Jesse was saying, it gives me chills when she said that because I felt so identified with that because um, we as a person, we need to know where we're coming from. We need to know our grounding. We need to know our roots. We need to know because that's how we get to um, continue. If we get to um, keep going because if we don't know our past, we will not gonna be able to go on. And this one was a period when I, um, I was transitioning from, M from bachelor to the MFA and it was tough, as I said. The wings that you see on the back is the wings for my spiritual um, animal, which is the dragonfly. So it was important for me to be able 
to identify myself with the nature through the dragonfly. Why the dragonfly? Let me tell you a short story about it. So uh, when I was a child, I remember growing up, it was so different from our childhood and our children's childhood over here, because we get to play in a very friendly environment. Right here, it is totally different. So um, it was important to me to go back home, go back home and remember all those happy moments that I used to um, have when I used to chase the dragonfly. And it was a challenge. It was a very hard challenge for me to get to catch one. But uh, the story is that I kept with the um, consistency. I was persistent until I get to catch one. And after many tries, I, I caught one. And that's how I wanted to um, blend in all those um, metaphorical aspects in this painting and also being able to share not only with myself, but with many other women. Because this one, I focus more in the um, um, woman, uh, woman figure, right? So this was, it is, the letter that you can barely see on the back, there's a lot of affirmation, positive affirmation that we can tell to ourselves and that they can identify with themselves. So I have uh, close to 150 persons to come and, and write on this drawing. It was kind of like a collaborative piece to drive to draw and write everything that they can tell to themselves and so they can transmit it to other one. So I believe that we as a woman have the power to pass on. And Jesse was saying the same thing. We are empowered. So once we are empowered, we need to empower somebody else. And usually it is from woman to woman. And we are special because we are the one who carry life. So why not um being able to do it in this way through art right so that's all about this one i guess i went over <laughs> no no it's just, thank you so much for sharing all that i love hearing that story about the, the dragonfly um i i i would love to hear how you went from doing drawings to to printmaking because the work that you have in the show right now is uh printmaking and it's pretty different from the work that we were looking at um it's a bit more like photorealistic kind of, um, yeah. And I'd love to just hear about that and, and who these people are that are being featured in these prints. So um, going back to my roots when I was a child, uh, and guess he said something like that, multicultural, and being Hondurians, being Garifuna, and, but in this case, my mom, she is from another town and my dad is from another Garifuna town. They have two different towns, the same Garifuna. So when we were growing up after school, after we finished the whole entire school, and if we get to do good at school, we used to be, um, it was our, our, our gift since we did good at school to go to one of our parents' town. So I used to go to my mom's town most of the time, but on my dad's side, it was kind of like, like more um, countryish. It was more like um, everything was so different than what I was expecting at the, the city, because this is more the town. So these pictures, this is a series of three uh, right here in the exhibition. I only have two. But this is a series of three. And this woman over there, they are a woman who literally, they do hard work. So uh, the form of living over there is very difficult. But what I like to see uh, about this woman is the fact that they are always trying to do better. 
for their children, for their um, families. So um, they are the head. They always the head because they, they need to be able to survive so their children can see all of that. So in a sense, we I am trying to do the same thing with my children being the example because telling them where I'm, I'm coming from and that the importance of um, uh, recognize where, where their parents are coming from, right? So we coming from having nothing to being able to work hard and have whatever we have right now. So these three women have three different generations, three different stages. And one of them, she, this one right here, she is carrying the fish. The other one is carrying the, um, the plantain. And the other one, this one, this one's carrying the plantain and the other one's carry is uh, grinding the coconut. So there's three steps. And the number three is very mystical and spiritual uh, in my process of, of, of making art. Why? Because I want to honor the three persons spiritually in my life. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So I always get to work in three series. The number three is a special um, number for me. And also because I have three kids. So each of my kids for me carry one person, the divinity. And also because I, dis I noticed that my life, every time I get to do something, it always comes at the third time. First time I try, nothing's gonna come up. Second time, nothing. And the third one is when I get to get things done. So I'm starting to learn that patience needs to be consistent and that I need to learn how I learn and how to get to do things. My patterns, my own patterns. And last but not least, I remember when I applied for my bachelor degree at the University of Houston, I applied three times. The third one was the one with, with, when I was accepted. So yeah, so it is a pattern. So that's why the number three is my lucky number, I will say. Yeah. And um, from pre-making, I mean, from drawing, painting to pre-making, which is the one that I'm currently working on, Oh, wow. I was sharing with Beryl that um, I get to meet my teacher when I was working on my master's degree. Her name is, um, her name is Esther. Esther, as soon as I, I, I saw Esther, I clicked with her and in a positive way. Because first, I did not tell you that, Veronica, but Esther is my sister's name, me and my sister, we are just like this. So when I heard Esther, so I said, oh my goodness, it could be my sister. And we clicked like, like sisters. She is from another mother, but she is my sister. She is from the mother country, Africa. She's from Africa. She's from Ghana. And uh, she taught me every, well, not everything. She taught me a lot about print making and I stuck with this one, this, this technique. So that's why um, I'm, I'm enjoying this process. And I remember the first ever plate that I did, it was a eight by 10. And I, I'm going bigger and bigger and bigger every day. So this size is 18 by 24. That's the biggest one that I, I am, um, I had get to work on. Yep. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you're welcome. You mentioned that you're a professor as well. Um, and just talking about like arts and higher education, you know, historically, that's a very white dominated space, not only in the professors, but also in the classmates that we have. 
And that's something that I felt personally really affected my experience in undergrad and in graduate school. Um, and the one time I had a chance to teach a college class, um, I tried to keep that in mind and what I was teaching the students and um, what the curriculum was like um, for that semester. And so I just wonder in, in your own personal experience, being a professor now, like how do you channel that sort of representation within your, um, your classes? Well, right now I'm cur currently teaching not art for pre-K three, but I'm trying to carry on with this. I'm trying to to bring this as a as a life rule, I will say. Uh, and for me, it will be stick to your roots, stick to what you believe is a true to you, not what is what you believe is true to others or what others gonna think about. But you need to be true to yourself and whatever you believe that is going to bring you to another level, just go ahead and, 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 and pursue and practice and, and try to do your best. Because that's what I wish to have from my previous teachers, because as I said, as I mentioned before, I didn't get to see any representation of my culture when I was um studying in my country in my own country right but now i get to see that i i have the power to choose and when i get to when god gave me gives me the opportunity to teach these kids i'm gonna carry on to the same level of what i wish to have in the past you know because yes it's predom predominantly white or and we been seen as because uh, my work in general sometimes it get confused because they think that it's from Africa and not from Central America and I keep that it is similar because we are still black people but the fact that uh, the culture the small things like the hair wrap, the skin, or many other um, um, uh, little things like the food, and also how they dress. It's similar. It's very similar. And I always need to, to be correcting people about saying that this is not from Africa. This is from Central America. But where is Central America? Central America is located over there. And this is from the Garifuna culture. But yeah, we have challenges. But we overcome the challenges with our positive attitudes, with our attitudes toward it. Yep. OK, thank you so much. And is there anything you'd like to share that you're currently working on or where you see your work going towards? So uh, right now, I am working on another printmaking, a series of three. This one is, um, I try to work and find an intention for my work. I think about it and then I uh, find the images. And then once I find the images, I um, see the connections between this one and the other one. And my connection right now, my focus right now is woman empowerment. So I'm making three, another one, three different women. And I'm using the uh, photograph from a very prestigious um, artist and the photo, uh, photographic artist. His name is um, David Maldonado. And I'm using two of his, his um, um, photos plus one of mine. So it's kind of like a collaboration with him. And the woman that I'm working on right now, she is from my dad's town. She is, um, she is a relative of my dad. She is my dad's family. And uh, uh, the other two, it is, also three generations i will say yes another three generations and i'm focusing on wisdom i'm focusing on um uh, spirituality 
and also I'm focusing on identity. Yeah, that's what I'm currently working on. Thank you. Thank you for sharing everything with us too. I appreciate all your stories. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna move on to the next panelist right now, um, Kim. And, <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, and I'd love to hear about your journey just also as well as an artist and how you found yourself um, using ceramics as your preferred medium. And also just if you could speak about the iconography that is repeated throughout a lot of your pieces. Yes, so I went to undergrad at the University of Southern Missouri for painting and ceramics. And for me, working two-dimensionally and three-dimensionally really went hand in hand when I couldn't understand an idea, a form, um, and on a drawing or painting then I can try to work it out differently uh, three-dimensionally with clay and um, I ended up pursuing ceramics in grad school after after that and the work I did in grad school was really more sculptural um, like sculptural intestines like wall hanging pieces that had stippling and <clears throat> uh, figurative drawings but a lot of that was rooted in um, research that I was doing on the history of anatomy and how that sort of intersected with um, the occult or religious iconography and the idea of a collection. Um, when we think of maybe like medical collections or when you're in a church and you see a lot of um, relics and reliquaries. And so it was kind of like blending and mashing all these ideas together on these ceramic forms. Um, and then after getting out of grad school and, and trying to recalibrate what is the work that I'm trying to make? Um, what does it really, I guess, mean to me? And what I find exciting about the work that is in the exhibition at Stamp Gallery is that that really felt like sort of finding the right key to the lock of the work that I wanted to make. Um, something that didn't just feel good and right because it was, you know, well researched and made a certain way, perhaps, but maybe something that just felt true to my gut for the first time. And that was, um, I guess, reconnecting with my my mother, who's uh, from Panama and lives there currently, and getting to visit her and um, starting to see my memories of living there and um, our conversations, even the ones that we have multiple times a day, um, kind of intersecting onto the ceramic work um, and blending with the ideas of the body and uh, saints. And so in this particular piece, this is um, one of the ones I did earlier on where it's a, a platter form hanging on the wall. Um, I like repeating this tooth imagery because for me, the tooth is like the perfect symbol of a whole body. Um, you know, we recognize it when we see it, we all have our personal feelings about teeth and histories with them. And sometimes they're like these weird little things that get passed along, you know, whether that's our, our histories um, with families, whether that's, um, a, a different loved one. I just like the idea of the small body part being left behind um, and connecting us to someone. And so I'm, I always repeat that in the imagery and collage that in with the figure. Um, the majority of the forms that I create are really also influenced by intestinal forms. Um, and so the border of the plate is actually sort of a very loose, almost uh, graffiti-like uh, intestinal form on this particular piece. Great. Um, and I, I, when we spoke last, you mentioned that there was this, um, a bit of like a struggle in trying not to make art that's too personal mm -hmm. or close to home and making it more like research based um which is something that i feel like i've also experienced through grad school like you know studying art in grad school and just kind of pushing away the personal but then somehow rediscovering that afterwards um could you speak about that a bit yeah um i think my feeling in grad school was that it had to be again like very research based it had to be able to like cite a lot of sources and and this was good and right and like this would this is the right thing to be doing and 
um, maybe making work that was too personal was a, a crutch or something I didn't want to lean on or wasn't didn't know how and but it turns out I didn't know how <laughs> so um, and then once I you know started having those conversations with my mom and and got a chance to revisit um, it it came more naturally and that's that's where I, that whole like feel it in your gut that this is like what you're supposed to be making or this is the these are the right ideas the right work the right imagery um it, it comes more naturally it shouldn't be a, a forced thing it shouldn't fit into a box very neatly um which i think is what i i thought that i was supposed to do before um yeah and and uh this particular plate again with the uh um, intestinal imagery. I also work as a florist uh, during the day. So I kind of like uh, blending some of the floral imagery. These are wax flowers um, at night on this platter hanging to the wall. Yeah, I think you've mentioned also that you do um, some of the drawings on tracing paper and they get repeated in the different pieces as well. Yeah, so um, I try to do a lot of my sketches like in a notebook. Um, a lot of times it's from direct observation. So hands, feet, uh, portraits are all done from direct observation. And um, the flowers, if I can, like I can remember laying on my couch, like I should draw this <laughs> when I did this piece. And um, then I will take tracing paper and trace the drawing. And when the clay is still, um, like leather hard, then I can lay that on top and use a um, stylus tool to lightly trace out over the graphite of where the drawing is, peel back the tracing paper and see a very light impression of the imagery and carve from there um, what I want to do. The intestines and some of the floral imagery, um, the papayas and some other ones, I think I've drawn those enough and the teeth that I don't need to use the tracing paper, but definitely like legs, more intricate flowers, um, banana clusters is another one that I'll definitely use tracing paper on and a uh, tiger imagery that I've been incorporating more into the work. And what I like about having access to these drawings over and over again is that I can rework them, you know, like um, maybe it doesn't work the first time maybe that wasn't the right piece or the right, right composition and so i can kind of play with what else could i have remixed this with to make it stronger and understand that drawing better and um give it a little bit more power than what it had before great um and also i just wanted if you could dig a little bit deeper and and describe just like why how did you find yourself being interested in um anatomy within sculpt sculptural pieces like how was that um how did you find yourself just like that being the, the thing that you're researching deeply during school <laughs> <laughs> um well, I went to school thinking like, I'm going to be a figurative artist. You know, I really loved um, like Bernini was my hero and um, the Leakwan sculpture of uh, the man with his sons kind of intertwined by the serpent. And I was like, oh, I'm that is what I'm going to do when I'm an artist. <laughs> Hyper realistic marble sculptures. And, <laughs> and um, then once I, you know, when I was in college, I was thinking a lot about ideas of like how we fill ourselves to feel whole. Um, and that was working with figures and kind of dousing them with pastries and sweets and this idea of like abundance, you know, looking at Rococo and Baroque ceramics, and a lot of uh, filigree and, and soft colors. And then I got to grad school and things got a little dark and <laughs> I started looking more at um, like how we are affected by things, whether that was through the four humors or um, uh, just temperament and how that could be communicated. And then that took a little bit more of a turn into looking at just straight up anatomy. And I remember I was, had an old Gray's Anatomy book and was just like, what am I doing? I'm looking at these images. Like I'm, I'm, I should be able to make these my own. And I started 
um, like photoshopping different images of the intestines together and then collaging those and redrawing those. And I probably came up with like 50 different like nonsensical intestine drawings that I ended up drawing on ceramic forms. Um, and what I was really drawn to with that was um, this idea of, I don't know, like, uh, like an inner identity. I was doing these small portraits that uh, would hang at eye level and they were oval like and I wanted them to be like little reflecting pools and of looking into yourself almost literally. Um, I also took a trip to Italy to La Spicola and there was the anatom anatomical wax Venus which is this beautiful wax figure laying like very sexily kind of languid her hair is all done pearl necklace kind of thing going on and and in this like glass coffin and her intestines are just kind of pluming out of her body and the whole museum is amazing but to see these wax intestines on this beautiful woman just kind of exposed in that way um just really shook me uh and <laughs> i've just kind of i mean i think about that daily when i'm working on my forms like that's just so beautiful um and kind of magical in a way Yeah, I was actually wondering what this image was <laughs> when you sent it over. <laughs> and now I explain it, I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I tried drawing sketches and I think I just got so overwhelmed and excited when I saw it that my sketches are terrible. It's just like these like blind contours of the entire thing. I was like, what was I doing? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just the idea of like looking into yourself that I've mentioned before. And there was something I read once about the, these, I think they were called haruspices, maybe in like Greek or Roman times where they would like read fortunes through animal entrails. Um, and I, I kind of like the sort of like the mystery in that too. There's still some mystery happening here for me of what is the body or, you know, how do we understand the body? How do we understand ourselves? I definitely think also within your work, like that mystery and magicalness, like for sure it translates. Like I remember when I first saw your pieces in, in real life, I was like, oh my God, these are such precious, like mysterious objects that I don't really fully understand what they're about, but I love them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm confused by them sometimes myself. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know that you um, have uh, pieces that are like flat, but you also have pieces like this that are like bases, bases vases, and also ones that have like the, some of the pieces that are in the show have little uh, sort of like slender pieces mm -hmm. sticking out of them, sort of like as if for flowers, I'm mm -hmm. assuming, but it might be wrong. <laughs> but I was just wondering if you could speak about those, um, like in, in contrast to the pieces that you have that are a bit more like plate symbols. Yeah, so definitely like the work that I'm making now, the work in the exhibition is so different from what I was doing when I was at uh, university. Um, those were all sculptural and I just had this transition where I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And working at the flower shop and seeing these vases and things that we were using, I was like, well, I can certainly do that. And um, I'd always wanted to collaborate with the drawings I was doing on my sculptures with somebody. And then I was like, well, why don't I just make them myself? What am I waiting for? Uh, who am I waiting for? And so it kind of became a process of learning how to make functional forms. And it's still a process for me. That's not something that I explored when I was going through my, my ceramic education. It was strictly sculptural. And um, so these are exciting, the, the large vessel forms um, with the handles or the tubes. And um, I like with those being able to work all the way around, you know, it's almost like, where do you put them? Cause there's a surprise on the other side. Um, and that just feels like it underneath as well there's a surprise too yeah. <laughs> sometimes underneath there's a surprise too so it just feels like a more dynamic kind of a canvas oh thank you for sharing that yeah. um, i appreciate hearing hearing what your take is on it because i've i've heard different interpretations from different people who have looked at it and like these aren't for flowers there's it's something else like i'm just like i think they're for flowers <laughs> yeah it started off that way but then i i wonder sometimes like what's the functionality of it really like i have a I don't know if you can see like a piece here that's like a it's a nonsensical double picture so like could you pour something out of out of it i'm not quite sure but it gave me all this room to to play with the papayas and the saints um 
on here, which is a lot of carving. That's amazing. Um, I have one last question for you before we finish. Um, I, out of all of us here in the panel, um, and including myself, um, I believe that you're the one artist that's based in a part of the U.S. that doesn't have a really big Central American community. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to like ask you just how, like, the, what is the importance of finding the Central American community, like, virtually via social social media or just like online in general? Like, how is that for you? What does it mean for you? It was huge for me whenever I saw, I came across um, La Horchata's call when I applied through uh, a Saint Susia post on Instagram. And I was just like, well, this is, cool. this is, this is interesting. Like what is going on over here? You know, I grew up in a predominantly living in Missouri, living in the Midwest, uh, predominantly white community. Um, which you know my mother could attest to from her experience uh, having lived in the U.S. for 25 years before she moved back to Panama, um, and so it was just exciting to see what other people are doing um, in the Central American community in the U.S. Other mediums, other ideas, like how do they talk about their experience and their identity too? Um, it was just incredibly exciting to see for me and to be able to connect with that in some way here from here okay thank you for sharing that um and this wraps up the individual sections for each artist um, and we can move towards just having a more general conversation and if anybody who's watching has any questions please feel free to type it out on the youtube chat um and it'll be relayed to us as well um, but in the meantime, like if any of you all just like have any thoughts or just anything, thoughts, questions or anything at all you'd like to share with each other, um, I'd love to take this opportunity for all of us to just even just talk because I know we know each other, but it's mostly just through the internet. And this is kind of the first time we all share a conversation or even really see each other, you know, in real life sort of. to share with the group or just ask as well. Um, this is the time to do it. Okay, there's actually a question in the chat right now um, and it's for Jesse. Uh, the question reads, um, I'm really curious to hear more about Jesse's experience as a self-taught artist. Could you speak more about your path to the arts and give some advice to other self-taught artists? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know what I'm doing, one. <laughs> um, but um, I find that a lot of the struggles and I'm hearing, you know, um, from folks that are educated in the arts and know so much. And um, I felt like I don't, I don't really know these names and these great artists. Honestly, I didn't study art. Um, but if you stick to um, what moves you, um, the artists that are, are not self-taught, I mean, they're, they're sticking to what makes them tick and, you know, what inspires them. And um, from there, you, you create from the heart, right? You're going to create something beautiful. And um, as a self-taught artist, uh, a lot of the work that I do is just painting um, figuring out as I go, I'm learning techniques as I go. Uh, I'm gonna mess up, but that's okay. And um, yeah, I, you just you just gotta keep moving. Um, Desi, I just wanna tell you something. Dime. I really honor you for the path that you are taking. And I like the fact that you said that you are creating for, from your heart. And that's all we need. That's everything that we need. You don't need to be educated to create, you know? So you are in the right path. You are developing a sense of, of doing something good for yourself. And that's what it matters. And you are, um, uh, giving somebody else something out of your work, out of what you are doing. So that's excellent. And I really applaud you for that. Thank you. Thank you.
Appreciate that. Also, I just want to say that I'm just really blown away by you, both of you artists. Like, you just are both so incredible. Like, oh. I learned so much today. It's just like, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's another question here. Um, it reads, this is for, for everybody. Uh, what is a piece of advice you wish someone gave you as a young adult, like around like undergraduate age? I'll, I'll say, um, and I, I hope it's applicable, and I feel like I've talked to quite a few undergraduates at least recently that um, have asked similar questions about, I guess, life after an undergraduate school and um, whether that's going to grad school or trying to have an art practice. And I have learned even out of uh, grad school that it's about, I mean, really, making that time to be in your studio, but also like it's okay to to balance that with the real world um, and work and taking care of yourself. And I, I think I really wish I would have heard or seen more artists talking about that versus just going like straight to grad school and then just being an artist. It kind of felt like A, B, you just do one and then the other. and. Um, the reality is like we're working multiple jobs and making that time to make work and there's nothing wrong with that. For myself, I will say that sometimes it might feel like, um, it might, you might feel uh, um, some kind of guilt because you want to make more than what you think you're doing. And there's some pauses. So you pause because you want to be able to be a mother. You want to be able to have some kind of, um, I will say financial um, sustainable work that it will, you know that at the end of the month, you're gonna have a check. And then from that check, you are going to buy um, your supplies that you're gonna need for what it thinks to be uh, a, a, um, a time or self-care, somebody will say. But uh, people who are not in the art world would not understand how satisfying you feel when you get to be yourself submerged into your art. It is a time that nobody can be, not even your spouses, not even your children, nobody. This is a time, this is a self time that when you submerge into your own peace, you know that you are creating something for somebody at that moment, it's gonna be for you. But later on, you're gonna bring this to the world and somebody's gonna be delightful that you created whatever you created, right? And this guilt sometimes for myself is been, um, I will say three weeks without me doing nothing related towards and then suddenly I woke up and I will do more than what I have done in the past three weeks. And it's very satisfying. And um, uh, Kimberly, I really identify myself with your work because when I see black and white in there, mm -hmm. I'm just figuring out, I, I kind of get to see that it's a pre-making and I don't see it as a ceramic. <laughs> so I see the carving. I see the drawing, I see the ink in there. Mm -hmm. So it is kind of related, but it's very delightful. And when you put the figure, the anatomy inside the um, intestine, for me, it's kind of like the womb mm. of the mother. And when I see the hands kind of reaching through the intestine, I see, like my mom hands reaching to 
me when I was inside her belly. Mm -hmm. So um, it is a lot of interpretation that I can get through that. And at the same time, I'm gonna go back to the, to the power that we hold as a woman, the power of creation. So we've been created to create because our father created for that, created us for that reason. So we gotta hold on to that. In any other circumstance, circumstances that we can find ourselves, we never gotta um, forget that we are here for a purpose, for a reason. And doing art, we are fulfilling that purpose. Yeah. Um, I have a question for all of you as well. Um, just wondering if during your journey in becoming an artist and um, did you ever have any pushback or did you have full support um, from your families? My mom, if I, I'll, I'll talk, <laughs> my mom was always really supportive. She was, um, I think the creative one in our house, she was always drawing, um, you know, scenes from Panama or Guatemala um, from whenever we lived uh, down in, uh, at Fort Clayton um, and just creating things, you know, making our house. Actually, I loved, um, Jesse, I love the birds in your drawings because it so reminded me of, my mom had these beautiful wooden birds that um, some craftsmen had made in Panama that we had actually hung above our stairs. So as you were walking up, you'd be walking underneath all of these tropical parrots and things. Um, that's what that reminded me of. Um, but she, so she was really supportive. My dad, I think was a little skeptical, like, I don't know about this, but um, he, he came around. And I, I don't know if they completely understand what it is that I do. Um, but they're not mad. So. <laughs> yeah, it's always a, a different thing of like, are they accepting, but also do they fully understand? I feel like that's another leap. <laughs> I feel like when my parents came to see the show, they were like, oh, like this is what you've been doing this whole time. Like, <laughs> those like brief moments where they like actually do understand. It's like, oh, it's everything. <laughs> but yeah, do, do any of you, Celia or Jesse? Would you like oh. to for my side, I will say my mother was the one who was in a complete denial. So I remember that uh, my dad was the first one who discovered my passion for the arts. At the age of, I will say, between 11 to 12, and he told me that whenever I reach the age, I will go ahead and, and, and travel to Mexico and study over there. So my mom, oh my goodness, but now she is, she is my muse. She's one of my muse because the first ever portrait that I get to do, it was my mother. And I had never done any portrait of my father. So she's the lucky, she's the lucky one. The one that, she didn't believe that I was going to be fine creating, yeah. But yeah, they always think that, oh, what are you doing? You're gonna die, you're gonna starve, you're gonna, any things that they can say that we're gonna, not gonna be doing. And no, we're not gonna starve, we're not starving. We're just creating, we're doing something that it will up, uplift our spirit in our life, our, our emotional states. Cause it's therapeutic. Painting, drawing, and, and thinking, even thinking the time that you're sitting down and thinking of something, even though sometimes you're not gonna grab the pen or 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 the brush, or you're not gonna grab whatever um, material that you're gonna use, the the clay, but you are thinking, you're creating, and then once it, it gets into your mind, then you get to go into action. And, and then comes the process. So all of that, it is, it is important because you get to enjoy the process and then the outcome, you don't get really to enjoy the outcome, but the process. Well, that's what it happened to me. The process for me is key.
Um, I would say for me, uh, my mother has always supported uh, me to do, like encouraged me to do whatever it is I wanted to do. So I think um, my mother being, having immigrated and putting herself through school and raising two children on her own and like really that struggle, I, it was me who was like, I felt like uh, I need to do, I don't know, what is the American dream, right? What is it that I can do to support my mother the way she supported me, right? Um, so that was, it, I felt like she has been supportive. And then when I went to college, I didn't go to college for, um, for art. I went for accounting. And I, you know, worked for big four. I worked for prestigious firms in Miami and it was a, a hard choice to leave it. And, you know, but because of myself, you know, and pursue art. And I also felt like I was letting down my own mother by doing that because of her own struggles. So uh, it was, um, she is so very supportive. She, you know, our, my home is a multi-generational home. My mother lives with me too. And uh, Celia, she's like one of my muses as well. <laughs> and, and my grandmother and yeah, it's, yeah. So I, um, I would say supportive. Yes, thank you all for sharing. I think that's all the time we have for now, I believe. Yeah, thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Celia, Jesse, and Kimberly. That was really wonderful and exciting um, to hear. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in for tonight. Um, and again, thanks to all of our sponsors for these programs so that we can um, bring in so many artist talks. And we will have one more artist panel uh, in a week next week, Thursday from 5 to 7 p.m. It'll be streamed here on YouTube and Facebook as well. Um, and you can see more information about that and the exhibition and catch the recording of this artist talk on our website stamp.umd.edu forward slash gallery. Thanks everyone. <laughs>